Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. In this week's episode, we're talking about how Pop-Up Magazine survived the pandemic. There were a lot of media companies that were vulnerable to the pandemic shutdown, but perhaps none more so than Pop-Up Magazine. Not only was its content delivered through live performances, but the host made special care during each event to tell the audience that nothing that night would be recorded. Part of the magic, in other words, was the show's ephemerality. Of course, there was no way Pop-Up Magazine could continue delivering on that promise once all in-person events went away. Instead, it had to adapt by somehow taking the magic of a live performance and delivering it over the internet. Not only did the magazine succeed in this endeavor, but the new restraints forced it to diversify revenue and expand its audience. With live events now returning, it's arguably stronger than ever. How did its staff accomplish this? In an interview last year, founder Chaz Edwards walked me through Pop-Up Magazine's pivot from the hellish first weeks of the pandemic to its recent return to live events. Before we jump into the interview, I want to talk about this week's sponsor. So let's say you're contemplating getting a bachelor's or master's degree in journalism, but you don't know which school you want to go to or how you're going to pay for it. Or maybe you want to enter a career in media, but you don't even know how to get your foot in the door. That's where Transition comes in. With Transition, you get one-on-one concierge counseling to navigate the next step of your college and career journey. Easy to use, affordable, friendly, highly ranked, Transition is the only platform your teenager will need. Visit Transition.com, that's T-R-A-N-S-I-Z-I-O-N, yes, it's spelled differently than you think it is, that's T-R-A-N-S-I-Z-I-O-N, I'll leave a link in the show notes. Okay, on to my interview with Chaz. Hey Chaz, thanks for joining us. Good to be here, Simon. So I think most of my listeners are familiar with Pop-Up, Pop-Up Magazine. In fact, uh, I've interviewed you before, so I definitely encourage them to go back and check check out that previous episode so they could get a rundown of you know the origin story and everything like that. Uh, but let's give them just a very brief overview. When was it founded? Sure. Pop-Up Magazine was, was first performed in San Francisco in 2009. We were doing it as a hobby at that time, so we didn't. We didn't start uh, touring the country with Pop Up Magazine until 2014. And pre pandemic, it was completely live, right? That's right. We, uh-huh. uh, Pop Up Magazine is a, we call it a live magazine. And what, what that means to us is we put together a, a collection of new stories, nonfiction stories by writers and filmmakers and photographers and radio people. They're all true stories. They're all brand new, never been seen before or published before. And we develop those into stories for live performance in a theater. So the writer or radio person or filmmaker is at a microphone reading from a script that we've edited in advance. There's a band on stage scoring the pieces. And above the stage on a giant screen is film and animation and illustration and so it's it's a uh, it's a live show that takes place in a big theater like like yeah. Lincoln Center or the Opera House at BAM or other big theaters like that around the country. Yeah, the the most analogous thing I would compare it to is like a live performance of This American Life, where you have kind of a series of stories. Some are first person narrations, more some are more kind of reported documentary um, stuff. You have I think you have like hosts that kind of introduce each segment, stuff like that. Yeah, that's that's right. I think that's a that's a, a great analogy, and it, it it's a collection of stories. You know, it's inspired by the idea of a general interest magazine, where it's a collection of different stories that that bring audience members to different places and different themes and different emotions. And we do have a host on stage. The host plays a pretty small role. It, it sort of welcomes the audience. There are always people there who have never been to a show before, so we tell them what's in store for them. And then we try to get out of the way and let the stories um, unfold and fill up the theater and fill up the hearts and minds of, of the fans who are out to enjoy an evening of stories with us. 
And it's it's hard to overemphasize how much this was dependent on live performance in the sense that every single performance that I went to, someone would, on stage would brag to the audience that they weren't recording and nobody <laughs> would else would see that version of the show again. That's that's right. That's right. <laughs> we, and we'll we'll get into how uh, how you know uh, devastating that was once <laughs> all live performances went away. But so uh, just a few more kind of brief background questions. You had like touring season, so you would have like a spring season, and then you would have all these venues, and you would have tour dates, and people would. Um, you, you were pretty savvy about like targeted advertising and marketing and stuff like that, so people knew that if you lived in Washington D.C., you were playing at this theater on this night. Yes, yes. So three times a year, once in the winter, once in the spring, and once in the fall, we would make a brand new show, all new stories, and we would take that on tour around the country. So we would announce it like a a, a touring season, and, and we'd try to visit as many cities as, as we could get to, usually between six and ten uh, stops on any given tour. Yeah, and then each each season – most of the stories were all the same, just touring around, but then you also had like maybe one or two like local stories. Right. Yep. Uh-huh. That's exactly right. So, th- so there would be sort of a, a, a collection of stories that would be in, in every show, whether you saw it in DC or Atlanta or Los Angeles, but generally each show would have something that was local and only happening in that night's show in that particular city. And revenue was just a mixture of t- ticket sales and live sponsorships. Right. That's right. So ticket sales is pretty straightforward. We would sell tickets anywhere from $35 to $75, depending on where you wanted to sit. And then we um, we bring sponsors on tour with us as well. And with them, we, we collaborate. We have a brand studio here at Pop-Up Magazine that works with our sponsors to take their creative brief and develop a live magazine version of advertising for them. And so what that looks like is you're sitting in the audience in between, let's say the second and third editorial stories that are being performed by Pop-Up Magazine. We take a commercial break and for 60 or 90 seconds, we we create a live multimedia uh, brand message from, you know, sponsors, sponsors for our upcoming show, you know, include uh, a technology company called Density and, uh, Mailchimp presents the software company, and and also a a, a, a liquor company uh, known as the Botanist Dry Isla Gin, who are we create sponsored vignettes on stage, and then you know, in the case of of the Botanist around this tour, we connect that to a signature cocktail that we'll be serving to fans of Pop Up Magazine before and after the show. And for a long time, you were affiliated with a sister publication called California Sunday Magazine, right? That's right. That's uh-huh. right. So, so we we paused publication of that during the pandemic, uh, but that's that's right. The California Sunday Magazine lived alongside Pop Up from 2014 to to uh, 2020, and uh, and and a lot of shared sort of know-how and DNA and creative thinking across the two brands. So even though we're not making California Sunday, the kind of photography that you, that you know, won us awards at California Sunday, the same photography team develops the, the, the visual experience that you see at the live shows. And Lauren Powell Jobs, her Emerson Collective is a major investor in your company. Uh, they were they from the beginning. Emerson Collective was a supporter of us uh, for about five years. We in in 2020 we spun off as a wholly independent company from Emerson Collective. Oh, interesting. Um, so that takes us up to uh, March 2020 pre pandemic. <laughs> so I think it's safe to say that the most media businesses got hit hard by the pandemic your business was especially vulnerable. Would that be accurate to say? That would be accurate to say last, yeah. last March was a, was a, was a really, you know, for everybody was a really challenging time. It was a lot of uncertainty and trying to figure out what to do going forward. I mean, that there were a couple of things that, that were, we didn't, we didn't have to think too hard about. One of them was we're not, 
you know, there's a pandemic on. It's not safe to gather thousands of people in close proximity inside theaters. So we we knew right away that we were going to cancel our spring 2020 touring show. So we called the venues, called the hotels and, and canceled that. One of the other things that we, that seemed obvious to us was that just because we weren't going to go on tour with a live show did not mean that we could hide under our beds and, and not bring stories to our audience and to our fans. And so we, um, the day that we announced to our staff we were not going on tour, we also opened a Google Doc and shared it with everybody at the company and said that we're not going on tour, but we're going to do something. And let's spend the next 24 hours populating this Google Doc with ideas for what we might do instead. And we gathered the company again 24 hours later and the document was more than 20 pages long <laughs> from mm-hmm. with 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 all sorts of of really creative ideas for how we could do what we do which is find and tell great stories and do them in in different formats in different settings in different ways so that we could still bring pop up magazine to people but we just wouldn't do it in theaters and it was it was at that moment on that second day opening up that google doc and seeing just how many wonderful ideas uh, my colleagues had put in there that I was, I was grateful that the, the, the team at Pop-Up Magazine, for the most part, are not uh, live theater people. That's not our background. Our background is in storytelling for radio or for magazines or for film or live experiential pieces. And so it's, it's a team of multimedia storytellers. And because the touring show of Pop-Up Magazine works with creators in so many different formats, it set us up very well to make a pivot in the pandemic to creating streaming video experiences, podcast experiences, live outdoor scavenger hunts, and, and, and other um, very different kinds of formats but very similar kinds of story experiences. Yeah, so we we mocked the phrase pivot the video, but you <laughs> yours was a r- rather drastic uh pivot to video in the sense of like you were not doing video and suddenly your entire business somewhat at least very early on relied he- like entirely on video, but you had like you said like you guys had already been doing kind of little mini documentaries that you wove into the live performance. So you certainly had that kind of broadcast expertise on staff, it sounds like. So you've, you you eventually settled first on a video strategy. That was your first iteration. What, was that the summer of 2020 or when did that debut? It, yeah, it was, it was the spring of 2020. So we had planned on being on tour with the new Pop-Up Magazine show in May of 2020. So we, not when the pandemic came, not only did we realize we're not going on tour, we also took a look at the stories that we had been working on in the months leading up to that. Some of them no longer fit the moment. And there were other things that felt very pressing to find stories about. And so we had to, to retool the program a bit. Um, but the biggest thing we had to do was, was produce these in a way that we could release them to the world as a streaming show on YouTube premiere. And, and the um, production of, of these stories in that moment was, was pretty challenging because not only could we not get in the same room with the contributors to coach them on their scripts and, and film them and control lighting, they, we, had to, we had to direct them remotely and, and our contributors were filming and recording themselves from their apartments, from their homes. We also. So they're like, so there's like a producer who's like squinting through Skype, making sure like, you know, from afar as the, you know, telling them to, how to point the camera or do the lighting or different stuff like that. That's right. That's right. So <laughs> we, we would send them a kit, you know, with, with an iPhone and an iPad in it. So, and we were able to work with them to kind of rig up, the equivalent of a teleprompter, but but a kind of a DIY version of that. The day before we we filmed it, one of our producers would would be on 
a video call with them, walk around their apartments to see, to pick a good background, to see how light fell on the room. And we then very much, we had to direct this thing virtually. And uh, so, so that was one element of one level of difficulty that we were working with. And another one was we, we couldn't, not only could we not have the band with the performer in the same room, the band members couldn't be in the same room together. Mm -hmm. And so, so our, our, our band leader had composed the original scores and then each individual uh, musician performed by himself or herself uh, against a click track. So they were, they were up, the, the band was playing by themselves. And then in, in the editing process, we merged together. So like they were like literally using a metronome to make sure they were staying on the beat. Like they couldn't hear the other parts. They couldn't hear the other parts. That's right. So they all performed individually, but as, as a viewer of the pop-up magazines, spring 2020 show, I hope that that wasn't apparent to you. The music sounded, (laughs) sounded like an ensemble (laughs) sound. It came together and we, we played with some, some fun graphical devices to, to, showcase the band as individual performers that were making one score together. Mm-hmm. So how did you release it? So it was released on YouTube. Obviously anybody could watch it on demand, but you tried to have every, have a lot of people watch it at the same time in some way. How did that work? Yeah. So, so we, so we were heading into it. We, we decided it was a moment where we wanted this to be free to anybody. Um, so we didn't try to charge for tickets. One of our sponsors, Google, helped us do that by, by stepping up with sponsorship funds to make this free and available to everybody, wherever you were. But then we leading up to the moment, we, we invited people to, to sort of appointment viewing so that we released it as, as a live stream um, using YouTube premiere, because we wanted an opportunity for, for our fans to get to enjoy these stories together at the same time, take advantage of chat in real time to try to approximate that the fun of a night at pop-up magazine, which, which is certainly a night of great stories, but it's, it's made greater because you're enjoying these stories with so many other people at the same time. You're laughing together. Your eyes are welling up together. You're getting angry together. You're getting inspired together. And so we, we, we released it um, live in that way to give people who wanted that opportunity a chance to, participate in real time with, with other, other fans of pop-up magazine. And then in the coming days after that, we released individual stories as on demand videos that people could watch at our YouTube. Yeah. Channel. So the first video was like 50 minutes long. It was all the stories packed into a single video. How many people watched it live? We had something in the neighborhood of 45,000 people watched the, the live stream, which for us, you know, when, when, the biggest theater we we rent when we go on tour can accommodate a little more than three thousand people. So, so when we when we tour across the country with a new issue, we're often selling fifteen thousand tickets or so. And so, so this opportunity in the moment in the live stream version allowed us to kind of put Pop Up Magazine in front of an audience that was three times what we do on a on a tour. And then if you if you take the the on-demand viewing, it, it went into the millions. And so, so the, the spring 2020 show was from an, from an audience standpoint was the biggest reach uh, show we've ever done. Yeah. And it makes sense that the shorter versions would, because they're more, <clears throat> more focused and shorter that they would go more, they probably went more viral than, or at least individual ones went more viral than the, the full 50 minute version. That's right. The the smaller the individual story segments were much more were much more shareable across social media platforms, and so those continued to reverberate and echo and pass from person to person. So much more of the audience ended up accessing that show, like entering through a single story on demand, rather than that sort of the the core super fans who tuned in to the full show live. So several months later, you have your second show. What did, what kind of did you learn from the first show that you incorporated into the next show? Well, you know, we we stayed in conversation with with that audience 
in a bunch of ways, you know, from May in a bunch of ways through through surveys, through gatherings in in uh, you know online virtual conversations. And one thing that we heard pretty consistently was that the the individual story experience, the sort of emotional resonance, the power, the the delight that they got from the stories matched what they experienced in the theaters in a lot of ways. So we, our audience gave us pretty high marks for the, for the production itself. But one thing they all felt they were missing is more opportunities to do this together. So some people were active in the chat, but particularly people who, um, who watched the show in an on-demand environment were doing so alone and they missed that. So as we headed into the fall of 2020, and for context, like, I don't know if we mentioned this about the live show is sometimes it was often the case that you would hand out some kind of packet and like for a segment on food or something, everybody would reach into the packet and find whatever food was being talked about and they would all put it into their mouth, like simultaneously or stuff like right. that. That's, that's right. That's right. And so we've, you're referring to a story we did with, with the food writer and television personality, Sunin Nostrat. She was telling a story from the stage about, um, how global politics and foreign policy and conflict and crisis around the world is something that actually affects the flavors on your plate. And so it was a, a very interesting story about food, politics, and, and, and globalism. And we, we made it more visceral for the audience members by including in everybody's program two different flavored marshmallows, one flavored with cinnamon from Vietnam, one flavored with cinnamon from Southern India. And it, it allowed us to kind of create this group experience with the audience that that was harder for us to do online. And so we, we um, as we headed into the fall, we said, how do we level that up where this pandemic is here for a bit longer? How do, how do we create that sense of community enjoyment of stories? And so one of the things we did with our, with our fall 2020 program is is we we launched the first episode of a new podcast that was designed to be listened to while walking. We we called the podcast Field Guide, and it was each each individual episode was was a collection of lots of little stories, almost like a mini audio pop up magazine show. For, You're literally becoming this American life. <laughs> we we can dream. We can dream. <laughs> uh, and and so so these. Each each episode of this podcast, the Field Guide podcast, had had a theme to it. One of them was under the night sky. One was walking. One was among the trees. And within each one, there would be 12 or so very short stories by different people and their experiences with trees. Um, uh, and we launched that as a podcast, and you could listen to it however you listen to podcasts. But we also teamed up with creative mornings um, to create field trips around each of these episodes. A a field trip in this context, meaning people RSVP'd at a certain time where we all met on our phones. Everybody dialed into a a giant Zoom call and people from multiple continents, dozens of different time zones, all would meet together. We would welcome them to a field trip that was about this one was about trees and um, people would say hello to one another, say where they were. And it was fun to see different times of day in the background as people walked. And then after we greeted each other and, and limbered up, we all hit mute on our own voice and together listened to this episode of a podcast while walking. And then at the end of it, regrouped to talk about it together. And so it was a way for us to bring, there were four different episodes and with each one, it was, somewhere between you know 400 and 800 people that got together and enjoyed pop-up magazine stories together but at the same time alone so that was something that not only was was fun for us to bring our approach to storytelling to podcasting you know, into the world of audio but it also allowed us to experiment with different ways to gather an audience so that people could have that communal feeling around stories. And I'm guessing that led to, so you eventually launched an arm that's kind of focused on 
corporate events and bringing pop-up magazine stories to corporate events. I'm imagining that like some of that interactivity gets incorporated into that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So even before the pandemic, we had part of our business was was corporate customers would commission us to bring pop-up magazine to their events. That might be an employee event. It might be a user conference. Uh, and, and, and generally it was, they were inviting us because we could build a, a very high emotion collection of stories on a theme. So for example, we did one with Nike where all of the stories we brought to the Nike event were sports related. And, and so Nike had a day of other programming for the global sports journalists and they invited us to help just kind of like elevate the the emotional tenor of the day by bringing sort of unexpected, delightful stories about the world of sports. Um, and so we, we were doing that before the pandemic, but the, the, need, the need expanded among our corporate partners during the pandemic. And what I mean by that is, you know, because all their events got boring as hell, even more boring, right? <laughs> well, exactly. Like they, they were dealing with the same problem we were, which is like, hey, we were planning this, you know, giant three-day event that had fun dinners and live music and drinks in addition to the programming. And, and now so, it's on Zoom. Now it's on Zoom, right? <laughs> and, and so that was a challenge that we we were all experiencing Zoom fatigue and screen fatigue, and so so our corporate customers came to us and said, "We need your help more than ever," and. And so we brought not only our, our approach to multimedia storytelling to their events in the streaming context, but in, in, we also brought some of these new tactics to the experience. You know, we, we um, last in 2020 during the holiday season, we actually did a pop-up magazine issue that we called Issue in a Box. And it was, it was a mail order uh, experience. You, you, bought, you bought a box. We shipped it to you, opened it up, and there were there were five pop up magazine stories inside the box that 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 were you know in some cases you you got something in the box but you had to call a phone number and hear the story played to you. There were interactive multimedia stories, but delivered to your home. So so we did that ourselves and sold it in the fall. But the the popularity of that allowed us to bring it to some of our corporate events. So we so in in early 2021, uh, we did a, a streaming show with Zendesk, the, the software company, and we developed with them stories that would be streamed online in a live simulcast. But we also brought this idea of the issue in a box to this. So we created a custom box where there were story souvenirs, story collectibles inside a box that connected to everything they would see on screen. And and the reason we did this was it, it's a way to hold people's attention. You know, we're very, very often we're looking at screens, we're multitasking, we're doing too many things at once, and we're not fully paying attention. And so through the use of this box that we built with Zendesk, we, we quite literally had something to tell the audience members to do with their hands. Like they were, they were unpacking the box, pulling items out that connected to, to the programming that they were seeing on screen at this live show. And so that's one example of the way some of the, the experimentation we did in 2020 in the pandemic has allowed us to, to serve our, our corporate partners in a, in a broader way as we head into 2021 and beyond. And it wasn't just live experiences that corporate brands were paying you to do. They were also help, or paying you to create on-demand content for them as well. That's right. So we've been we've been developing video and audio content for for partners. We also, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that you know we used to publish a magazine called the California Sunday Magazine that has been a finalist for. I think it's 17 national magazine awards and we won a Pulitzer prize in 2021. And so the capability we have isn't. You want a Pulitzer after you shut down? Yes. Oh man. (laughs) It was was, kind of amazing that pop-up magazine is out of the two businesses was the one that stayed alive. And the, the thing that was meant to be read on demand and on, and mainly online was the thing that shut down. It's I, I know they're, 
Strange times, strange times. But, you know, I, we were we were just delighted with the reception that California Sunday had and, you know, with awards and with audiences. And, and what that's allowed us to do is to continue to bring that capability to corporate partner events. Uh, an example of that is we work with Google as as part of their year in search campaign that they do in December every year that sort of is a look at a look at the date the search data from from a year and what does that tell us about where we're at as a as a global community and we work with Google to publish a print edition that is inspired by the year in search data and so that's something that we we did a pilot of that in at the end of 2020 and in at the end of 2021 we're we're doing a new edition of that that's bigger, more ambitious, um, and 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 a really amazing magazine experience that's under the Google brand, but is is something that allows us to build on the experience and, and success we've had as a as a print and digital magazine publisher as well. How big is your full time staff now? We have eighteen people. It's it's a it's a pretty small group uh, that's full time. The people that you see on stage at Pop-Up Magazine, the, the contributors who are telling stories, are primarily freelance journalists and independent documentary filmmakers and photographers who might <clears throat> do work for lots of magazines. And, and so when we, when we develop new work, whether it's um, editorial work that we put out into the public and sell tickets for it, or it's a private event for companies – it's a pretty small team staff team at pop up magazine and then we collaborate with our broader network of friends and collaborators and talented story makers mm-hmm. so the country is now opening back up but you know especially in cities uh not only are the majority of people vaccinated but a lot of not i wouldn't say a lot of cities but some cities are even uh requiring vaccine proof to get into venues and stuff like that you are returning to actual live in person events right that's right so november 2021 will be our first national tour of pop up magazine in 20 months or so and we are um we're going to be uh performing shows in the San Francisco Bay Area, Los Angeles, New York, and Washington, D.C. And we're taking the health and safety of our fans and our contributors and our staff very seriously, of course. And and so these will all be shows where uh, proof of vaccine is required to get into the theater. And when you're not having a drink in the lobby, you know, when you're actually in the theater, masks will be required at this show. So we're we're in collaboration with the venues and and following all of the the best practice guidelines from the medical authorities in each of the municipalities that we're visiting. So, um, so you're bringing back the live shows, but obviously, you know, you've now become a more multifaceted media company. So what's the dynamic between live and on-demand content now? The, so, so when we take a show on tour, when you're in the room, you've bought your ticket, you've come with some friends, that we're not we're still not filming that moment. We want that in the room, dark theater with a few thousand other people to be special and to be um, optimized for the medium of live, if you will. So so the shows will feel like your favorite pop-up magazine show from the past. What we are doing is as we've started expanding our capabilities into other platforms, what you are more likely to see is stories that debut on stage at Pop-Up Magazine are finding a second life, a third life in a new format, like a podcast or video or, uh, or, or a special project. Are you, is there like a time delay? So you're maximizing the value of the live event? Uh, there is a time delay, but it's 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 less to maximize the promotion of the event. It's more just a kind of a logistical thing that we are we are developing stories first for live to get them ready to go on tour with the show, and then that keeps us pretty busy for a little while. And then when we come out of that, we take a look at sort of what did we learn from watching how that show 
uh, landed with an audience? What worked? What didn't work? What could we do better? Wow, watching that in a darkened theater, I could imagine that being a segment of a television show. Let's. What would we have to do to adapt it for that format? Or, boy, listening to that story, the audio was so evocative. How do we adapt that into an upcoming podcast project? Yeah. So like, yeah, the first iteration was YouTube. We've also gotten into podcasts, but obviously there are a lot of other platforms out there, you know, ranging from TikTok to Facebook Watch to Snapchat, plus all the major streaming outlets. Have you be, have you, how much are you, is it still in the planning stages or are you vent, you creating and repurposing content for other platforms yet? We're, um, it's it, a combination. We, you know, we, we do, we, we do have a presence on all of the, all of the major social media and digital platforms. What, our philosophy with respect to any format, you know, whether it's a live theater or it's putting on a scavenger hunt show that you, you, it takes place on the sidewalks of New York and LA and San Francisco, we we always try to very deliberately understand how people like what they do in that format, how they like to experience what they're doing, and there's and there's certain contexts in which we are able to really. Um, give over all of our attention to something. So when you're in a theater, you've bought a ticket and you've come with some friends, you turn off your phone and you are prepared to give your undivided attention to what's on the stage and in the room for the next hour and a half or so. Um, When we're moving quickly through Instagram stories, we we, we have to think about programming that suits that shorter attention span theater. Um, and so we, as we think about like, what's next for us, we're especially interested in, in, in platforms, but sort of like audience headspace where there's an opportunity to tell a rich narrative story. And, you know, podcasting is a great example of that. When we're walking, when we're driving, when we're commuting, we are maybe looking at something else, but we're we're in a position where we can give our undivided attention to listening to something, so that's that's an, an arena that's very exciting to us. Whereas, um, you know, as we think about our future in TikTok, we have to we have to sort of con- continue to grapple with sort of what does that what does the cadence of TikTok mean for the kinds of stories we want to tell, and how do we do that right so that we wouldn't want to just snatch a story that might be eight minutes when it's performed live on stage at Pop-Up Magazine and try to push that onto platforms where people enjoy shorter form content. You know, it strikes me that like now that you're completely multimedia and on demand, uh, what's keeping you from basically resurrecting the California Sunday Magazine, but just underneath the the Pop-Up Magazine brand? Right, I, you know, it's sort of TBD. Uh, you know, we we um, we're trying. To, we've been doing a lot of experimenting, and we've had some success in a, in a variety of new areas. At the same time, we're a, we're a pretty lean team of people, and so we need to focus to some degree so that we don't get pulled in too many different directions. But but California Sunday, in its you know short period of time in the world, established a a reputation and, and a following that, um, you know, we want to figure out how we can keep doing that kind of work and getting it out to people who enjoy it. So to recap, you went into the pandemic with two main revenue streams. Uh, you had, you know, live events that sold both tickets and sponsorships. Now you're emerging, merging with, you still have the live events with the live sponsorships. You have free on demand video and podcasts that are sponsored you have corporate events like bespoke corporate events, and then you have branded content consulting. So in some ways you are, uh, you have way more revenue. You're well, much more diversified post pandemic than you were pre pandemic. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. That we, that we, um, you know, sort of by necessity or, or by opportunity that the pandemic, you know, forced us to think about new ways to collaborate with, with partners and to collaborate with, with fans who are willing to buy a ticket or a box. Um, We also, you know, had the time that we weren't traveling the country on tour gave us time to think about new ways that we could do what we do. And 
that's opened up new channels of of revenue for the business and and new ways that we can collaborate with a brand. Everything from helping them with their live or streaming events to story consulting to original content creation in a variety of formats. And so that's really given us a much greater breadth as a, as a business than we entered the pandemic. Okay, Chaz. Well, those are all the questions I had for you. Where can people find you online? Great. Well, thanks, Simon. Uh, for folks who are interested in learning more, popupmagazine.com. And uh, we always announce our new shows and new projects there. You can follow us on your favorite social media platform or join our email list. And we look forward to seeing you at an event or special project soon. Okay. Well, it's a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me. Thanks so much, Simon. Okay. Thanks for joining us. I'm actually on the lookout for new guests for this podcast. So if you do interesting stuff in digital content, whether you're you're a full-time YouTuber, a media executive, or run a cool niche newsletter, definitely reach out. My email address is simonowens at gmail.com. Okay. See you next week.